The stories that intrigue us most from our past are often the bloodiest and most horrific. Names like Vlad the Impaler, Richard III and Attila the Hun have an almost mythical status. And we remain fascinated by the dark deeds of Roman emperors and rampaging Vikings. But it's easy to forget that these people and their victims were real. And that the facts are usually more complicated than the bloody tale. I'm Joe Crowley, journalist and investigator. And I'm Dr. Susanna Lipscomb, historian and author. Together, we're going to discover the secret stories behind history's most infamous characters and events. Looking again at history's crime scenes. So this is it, this is case closed. Hunting down evidence. Wow, so look at these. So these are the proof. And coming to some very surprising conclusions. Think you know history's bloodiest tales? Time to think again. In this episode, we're investigating three of the most barbaric executions of all time and asking, do we really have all the facts? What is the astonishing new revelation about the botched hanging of an evil Nazi SS officer, chillingly portrayed in Schindler's List? We don't know uh, so many details about uh, his last moments. We have many legends, but no facts. Did the English really kill a feared Viking chieftain by throwing him into a pit full of venomous snakes? He brought horror to France, but the horror followed him back. And why was the real-life Braveheart William Wallace ritually dissected for treason? Wallace was guilty as charged, both in England and Scotland. He was a dead man walking. Thirteenth of September, nineteen forty-six, and former SS officer Amon Gert is about to be hanged in Krakow, Poland. He's been found guilty of causing the death of thousands of Jews. His senseless, sadistic murders were dramatized in the award-winning film Schindler's List. But now Gert faces his own death, and film exists of his hideously botched execution. Was this torment accidental or a terrible act of revenge for his heinous crimes? Our new research overturns previous accounts of the death of Amon Gert. At the end of World War II, many of Germany's top Nazis were put on trial at Nuremberg, and the full horror of the Holocaust was revealed. But Amon Gert was handed over to Poland, whose people he had brutalized for years. Later, Polish archive film of his execution surfaced on the internet, and hundreds of thousands of people have watched every macabre detail. On the first two attempts to hang him, the rope snaps. Only with their third try are his executioners successful. Ever since the publication of the book Schindler's List and the hugely successful film that followed it, many of the tourists here today are looking for evidence from that time. These tourist taxes even advertise trips to the Schindler's factory and to the ghetto. But what you won't find evidence of is of the man who put these places on the tourist map, SS officer Amon Leopold Gert. In the film Schindler's List, Gert is a murderous sadist. But what about the real man? How did he start on his path to the gallows? Hello, the you Hello. Hi, I'm Susie, hi. I've come to meet Alicia Yakovska Natkaniec, who's been making a special study of Gert's role in the Krakow Holocaust. So tell me about Amon Gert. What sort of man was he? What was his background? Uh, he was uh, born in Austria. Uh, in 1908, uh, he um, came from a middle-class family. Uh, they have a um, publishing company in Vienna. Do you think he was a committed Nazi? No, I don't think. Because of his character, because of his temper, and because he um, does uh, everything because of money, of um, prestige. 
1942, Goethe joined SS troops clearing the Jewish ghetto in the Polish city of Lublin. His efficiency and brutality attracted his superiors' attention. They were looking for someone to carry out the same job in Krakow. So what were conditions like here in the ghetto in the 1940s? When the ghetto was established in 1941, the conditions were bad. People were starving, uh, they live in a um, small area. And what changed when Amon Goethe arrived? He uh, started to kill Jews, to exterminate them in the ghetto. And um, it was in 1943, and I think uh, we mm, must go to the main square when that action, when that killing started. It's important uh, because it's the place uh, where uh, Jews were killed by shooting and it was ordered by Amon Gerd. After clearing Krakow's ghetto with his trademark violence, Gerd was given command of a new concentration camp where many of the city's former inhabitants had been sent. Plashov camp became Gerd's kingdom. As commandant, he believed he could murder and brutalize as much as he wanted. Thousands would die here while he was in command. So now I've learned something about Amon Gert and his terrible crimes that meant he deserved punishment. But now I want to find out something more about that botched execution. Why did the Polish authorities mess it up so much? Is it really that hard to hang a man properly? Or is there something more to the story? Clearly there's something not quite right about this execution. I've seen the film and it has an amateurish air to it. Well, I've come to Krakow to try and understand how Gert was brought to justice. Gert's reign of terror at Plashov camp ended in September 1944 when he was arrested by the Nazis' own secret police, the Gestapo. He'd been stealing Jewish possessions that Nazi Germany saw as state property. With the Nazi regime almost at an end, Gert escaped punishment. But in 1945, he was captured by American troops. He was sent back to Krakow for trial. Martina, hello, I'm Joe. Hi, Jack. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Archivist Martina Gradska has studied Gert's trial, and I've arranged to meet her at the old court building, now Krakow's archaeology museum. His crimes were well known, mm -hmm. so to what extent was it a proper legal procedure, and what extent was it just there to give him a death sentence? I mean, in general, we've got over 40 people who testify against him. Um, many um, people testified that uh, he was the most cruel man, and they mentioned that um, there was a small sign that uh, he's gonna kill somebody because uh, every time when he was wearing a white scarf and gloves, the day ended with, uh, with some people who were shot by him. The testimony of witnesses at his trial showed that Amon Gert was a brutal sadist who killed without reason. He was found guilty of causing the death of 2,000 Jews when Krakow ghetto was liquidated and of 8,000 prisoners at Plashov concentration camp. He'd also stolen valuables worth millions. What was his defense and, and how did he behave during the trial? Every day he denied. Uh, he denied that he committed crimes, he denied that he stole money. Uh, he did not seem to feel guilty. I mean, that he, he was actually very proud, you know, with his sarcastic smile. After his trial, Gert was brought here to Montelupic prison. And on that day in September 46, what do we know about Gert? What time was he brought down here to, to, to meet the executioner? Uh, we are not that lucky. We don't know uh, so many details about uh, his last moments. We have many legends, but no facts. Uh, there is this uh, very famous story that he said, uh, Hi Hitler at the end, that he smoked even before he was uh, executed. We don't see that in the, in the film of the execution, so something's not quite Something right. Something mysterious about his uh, last moments. But this is a military procedure. These yes. are military men hanging yes. him. I mean, what do the prison records say about Gertz? Um, just a simple sentence. He died. 
It seems extraordinary that Goethe was a high-profile figure, and yet there's so little documentation about his execution. All we have to go on is a short film clip that's had thousands of hits on the internet. Well, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. I'm equally baffled and surprised by what I've just heard. Here was a major war criminal who had carried out unspeakable crimes in this part of Poland. There is a real effort to bring him to justice, there's a full trial, and yet when it comes to this critical moment of carrying out the death sentence, it's just not recorded. There's a simple line that says, he died. So it's, it's kind of thrown up more questions than it has answers, really. There's something about the Gert case that just doesn't add up. The more I look at the video of Amon Gert's execution, the more I wonder if the failures were down to more than just bad luck. Could they have been some kind of retribution for a brutal Nazi killer? Or were the executioners just struggling to carry out the job efficiently? I want to find out just how a hanging is supposed to work. Now, to me, this is what a proper hanging gallows should look like. Look at the scale of it. It's much higher, it's much bigger, it's much more solid than the one we see in the Gert film. And that's because it's a replica. They actually hanged men here in this exercise yard at the old prison, what's now the Galleries of Justice Museum in Nottingham. Isn't this what they should have used when they hanged Amon Gert? Hanging has been used as a method of execution for centuries. The most notorious recent hanging was that of Saddam Hussein in 2006. One of the few people in Britain today who has studied different hanging techniques is Gary Ewart. I'm hoping you can tell me a bit about hanging and, and how it should be done properly. Judicial execution was quite a technical process because the hangman would have to work out the correct length of drop to ensure instant death. If they drop them too far, it will pull the head off. Too short, they would strangle. I'm hoping that Gary can help me understand exactly what went wrong in Amon Gert's case. Look at that straight away. The thickness of the rope there. It's like a washing line. So the rope is too thin? Way too thin. There's no way is that going to take that sort of weight under impact. The pit isn't deep enough. It must be about three foot, that's all. Now, with the inclement weather, all the snow and ice about... Why would that affect the rope? Well, if it's got ice in it, it's going to be frozen up, so it just break. So this is a completely botched execution? Oh, yeah, completely botched. That guy would take up to 25 minutes to die. I find it horrifying to watch the slow strangulation of a human being. And Gert's executioners themselves obviously found the hanging a traumatic experience. There's no indication of retribution, just stress and frustration. I came here to the Galleries of Justice to find out why Amon Gert's execution went so wrong and if they just didn't care about doing the job properly. And it certainly seems that the people doing it had no idea what they were doing. But the thing that really stays with me from talking to Gary is that he said there was snow on the ground. Now, Amon Gert died on the 13th of September, 1946. September. Surely that would be too early for there to be snow on the ground. I'm beginning to wonder whether it actually is the convicted Nazi Amon Gert's execution, or if it's just a fake, or someone else. I think for Joe and I, this changes the whole investigation. Schindler's List gave Amon Gert a kind of sinister fame, and the film of his execution has somehow added to it. But Susie's research has thrown up doubts about that film and our whole investigation. Now, I've got to say, when I first saw this film, the snow didn't register at all. I barely noticed it. But when you think about it, it would be quite unusual for September. I've done a bit of research. And just as Susie suspected, this is a weather chart for Poland, September 1946. And the temperature is between 6 and 8 degrees centigrade. Far too warm for snow. So that's got to make you wonder if this film really is the execution of Amon Gert. I've come to see forensic imagery investigator Jackie Butterwick. The first thing I need to establish is the identity of the man being hanged, who we're calling Man X. And Jackie has some shocking news. If you can find one significant difference between two people, you can say they're not the same person. Ah, 
And, and that's what you think you found here, one significant difference? I have found a number of significant differences. <laughs> really? Okay, this is very strong then. Talk me through the comparison you've made here. So first of all, we have the form of the right ear. The shape of the lobes are different, right. with the lobe appearing more attached on Mannix than it is on Mr. Gert. Yeah. Then the tip of the nose is hooked on Mr. Gert. Mannix's jawline tapers straight towards the chin from the earlobe. Yeah. Whereas Mr. Gert, it drops down from the earlobe oh, and, then okay, and then tapers across. towards. So you've got that sort of square jawline. The dark tone on the side of uh, Mannix's right cheek. Oh yeah, and so would that, this that is the, there. The, the red arrow, and this is observed on numerous frames of the imagery of Mannix, and is consistent with a mole on the side of his face, and this feature is absent on Mr. Gert. So our man being hanged here is not Amon Gert? Correct. That's incredible. Jackie was able to compare the man in the hanging film with other Nazi war criminals. According to her, all the evidence suggests he is Ludwig Fischer, the Nazi governor of Warsaw, who was executed there for war crimes at the beginning of March 1947, when Warsaw was blanketed with snow. Amazing. Jackie, thank you so much. Welcome. You've cleared a lot up for us, and um, that's big news. Amon Gert is not the man in the film. No, he's not. Definitely not. So there we have it. This is a real breakthrough. This grainy film, which has been viewed by hundreds of thousands of people online, all of whom reckon they're seeing the last moments of Amon Gert's life, they're not. We can now categorically say it's not him. Now we finally have the evidence to correct this historical error. So, what did happen to Amon Gert? Well, the truth is we have very little to go on. Just those two words in the prison records. He died. When we set out to investigate Gert's botched execution, we had no idea things would take such a dramatic turn. There's still a mystery about Gert's last moments, but at least we've been able to expose one crucial error in the story of this brutal man. It's 8.45 AD. Feared Viking warrior Ragnar Lodbrok has been captured by the English king of Northumbria and is to be thrown into a pit of venomous snakes and bitten to death. For years, Ragnar has been raiding, plundering and killing, but now his time has run out. In his last words, Ragnar warns that his sons will avenge his death. So did this dark prophecy come true? And did Ragnar really die in this sadistic way? When Ragnar was executed in 845 AD, the Vikings had terrorized Europe for decades. Their tactic was simply smash and grab, with monasteries and churches the most profitable targets. And they didn't stop with Europe. At the height of their power, these Scandinavian pirates crossed oceans and set up bases as far afield as North America and Asia Minor. To find out more about Ragnar's bizarre execution, I've come to the Royal Library in Copenhagen to meet Norse historian Dr. Rory McTurk. Rory, good to see you. How are you? Okay, thanks. He wants me to see the oldest existing manuscript of Ragnar's saga. So how can this help us find out more about his death? Does it have an account of his death? It, it gives a graphic account of his death, um, how he was thrown into a snake pit and died there as a result of the bites of snakes. Wow. Can you read me an extract? Uh, certainly, yes. Many snakes have sucked me. I shall soon be a dead body and die among beasts. So there appears to be some foundation to the legend that Viking warrior Ragnar Lodbrok died from snake bites. As he dies, Ragnar predicts the deadly revenge that his sons will take. The porkers would grunt if they knew the fate of the boar. They would dig in their snouts and squeal mightily 
Incredible. So it talks about the anger and the anguish that we felt by his sons that they will want to avenge this death. Indeed, yes. It's the first clue that Ragnar's sons would wreak revenge for their father's death. But the language used in this account sounds suspiciously melodramatic. So when does this actually date to, this song? Um, sadly, very long afterwards. Uh, the manuscript dates from 1400. So this isn't 9th century? No, I'm afraid not, no. Some three to four hundred years after the events that it's supposed to be about. It's an absolute privilege to work with a manuscript like that, but I'm not sure exactly how much use it's been. It's completely wrapped up in mythology and it's written 400 years after Ragnar died. Now, even today, we struggle to accurately depict history from 400 years ago. So, it's got limited value, to be honest. If I want to find out more about Ragnar's death, I'll have to track down some other accounts of what he was up to in 845 AD. Joe's investigations have revealed that the legend of Ragnar's death in the snake pit has been around for centuries. But we're no closer to finding out what actually happened. Now, I'm no snake expert, but it seems to me there's something a bit odd about this whole snake pit story. It's all a bit Indiana Jones. Time to call in the experts. I've arranged to meet herpetologist Mark O'Shea and find out if the snake pit story really adds up. He's asked me to meet him here, on moorland similar to the kind of place Ragnar is believed to have been executed. I need to know if it would be possible to have found enough venomous snakes in England to kill a man. What snakes would have been here? Exactly the same species as you find today. And the only venomous snake here would be the adder or viper. But this is perfect habitat, and Northumbria would have been full of heathland moorland. These snakes are the first bit of evidence suggesting that the legend of Ragnar's death could actually be true. Adders are Britain's only venomous snake, and in Ragnar's time, there was no such thing as anti-venom. But could snakes like this kill, you know, a great, tough Viking? I can think of plenty of snakes that would see off a big, scary Viking like Ragnar, but um, I don't think this is one of them. They're not aggressive animals. They're, they're, they're quite docile animals. I mean, they're sitting on my, hand, my glove there and they're not trying to bite me. No, they're trying to get away from they're you, anything, aren't they? They're trying to get away. They? And, that's, and, and if, if there was a snake pit, I think that the snakes had tucked themselves away into little safe nooks and crannies. I consider snakes rather inefficient tools for murder. Mark's knowledge of snakes confirms it's highly unlikely Ragnar could have been killed in an English snake pit. So why did the Norse saga writers describe him being killed in this way? Was it to justify an invasion or perhaps even to conceal the truth about his death? So if the snake pit story is just that, a story, then how did Ragnar really die? Susie's discovery blows the story of Ragnar's snake pit execution out of the water. So where do we go from here? England certainly wasn't the only target of Viking raids at this time. France was also on their hit list. And one of the most devastating Viking raids on France was led by Ragnar himself in the very year he supposedly died in an English snake pit. My quest to discover more about Ragnar Lodbrok has brought me to Paris where the Vikings raided in 845. 120 Viking boats sailed up the Seine from the coast, and of course the river brought them right into the heart of the city. I'm meeting a historian who studies exactly what happened when the Vikings hit Paris, Dr. Elizabeth Rowe. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. According to Elizabeth, Ragnar and his pirates attacked a church that in 845 was just outside the city, the Abbey of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. The oldest part of the abbey is built on the remains of the very building Ragnar captured. What can Paris tell us about Ragnar? Well, what we know about him is that he led a raid to Paris in 845, 
came away with thousands of pounds of gold and silver, and that's history. That's the actual fact behind the legend. He and his men were, were ferocious, rapacious, brutal, predatory. They were completely intimidating. And also, their, um, their demands were unheard of. When Ragnar and his men arrived, they were so fearsome that the French coughed up more than 3,000 kilograms of silver. But treasure wasn't the only thing the Vikings took home from France. Why do they finally leave Paris? We have several independent accounts of the Vikings being struck by disease. They talk about the bodies being uh, swollen with flatulence, um, pa griping, griping pains, and the Vikings were dying as they were going off. He brought horror to France, but the horror followed him back. So finally, I'm getting beyond the legend to some actual facts. We know Ragnar was here in Paris. He was fearsome. He plundered. In a word, he was unstoppable. But then we get this intriguing hint of disease, a mystery disease that affects the Vikings. So what happens to Ragnar? Where does his real life saga go from here? Joe's discoveries in Paris confirm my theory that the whole snake pit story just doesn't add up. So what next? I've come to Hedebu Viking Museum in northern Germany in search of conclusive evidence about Ragnar's death. More than a thousand years ago, Hedebu was a major Viking settlement. Now the crucial thing about the Viking settlement here at Hedebu was that it was a major trading centre for the region. And we have an account from soon after the Paris raid of a foreign observer to the Viking king's court here that may give us the clue we've been looking for. I'm heading to the reconstructed Viking village to meet Professor Rudy Simek, a leading medieval historian who has studied accounts by the Vikings' enemies and trading partners. A visiting diplomat, Count Cobo, related what happened when the Vikings returned from Paris with their booty. Cobo reported back to a French monk who wrote that down in, in a manuscript. He reported that Ragnarius came back from this raid on Paris in 845 and came back and boasted about all the gold and silver he had stolen. According to Rudy, Ragnarius is in fact our Ragnar, returning triumphant after the raid on Paris. But does Count Cobbo shed any light on what happened next? So what does the account have to tell us about Ragnar's death? Because of this boasting, St. Germanus is meant to have visited him and struck him down so that he split in two and his entrail spilled and he stank to high heaven. Cobbo's account of Saint-Germain-de-Pré's patron saint taking revenge is as incredible as the tale that Ragnar died in a pit of snakes. So what disease did Ragnar and his men bring back from Paris? With the description of rupturing intestines and an appalling smell, I'd put my money on dysentery. So how do we explain the fact that there are these two very different stories? On the one hand, you've got the heroic death in a snake pit, and on the other hand, you've got this horrible, gruesome story of him being pulled apart and bursting out his entrails. Well, both are pretty gruesome death. One is the story of a monk who wants to show that Ragnarius is the perpetrator of all evil, and he wants to show him have a particularly vile death. On the other hand, no storytellers, possibly even the sons of Ragnar himself, also wanted to show him to have had a vile death, to glorify this heroic attempt to conquer England. So it's all just a good tale. Well, it's even two good tales, <laughs> it which is even better. So Ragnar's death is still wrapped in legend, though it's more likely he died of disease than in a snake pit. But 20 years after his death, the Vikings did invade England. Some sources claim that the men who led the invasion were Ragnar's sons, avenging his death. Is it a genuine claim? To me, it's much more likely that the saga writers used his death to justify a massive Viking land grab.
23rd of August, 1305, and Scottish rebel William Wallace is about to be executed for treason. His revolt against the English and his terrible death were graphically portrayed in the Hollywood blockbuster Braveheart. Now he'll be the first Scot hanged, drawn and quartered by the English, and his body will be publicly displayed to teach his countrymen a lesson. But how did the English manage to capture this famous warrior? And why was he so brutally executed? Seven hundred years ago, England and Scotland were bitter rivals. England's powerful king, Edward I, was determined to control his neighbours. But in 1297, a battle took place which created one of the greatest heroes in Scottish history, William Wallace. On the 11th of September 1297, William Wallace exploded onto the historical scene right here in Stirling in Scotland. He was one of the commanders of an outnumbered Scottish force who destroyed an English army against all odds just upstream from where I'm standing now. But only eight years after this incredible victory, Wallace suffered one of the most violent punishments in English legal history. He was dragged through the streets, choked, had his entrails pulled out, and was hacked to pieces. So what went wrong? I want to find out more about the man, and I'm hoping that tower behind me on the horizon will be a good place to start. This is the Wallace Monument, close to the site of that stunning victory at Stirling Bridge. On display here is the huge sword said to have been used by Wallace in battle. Its size suggests he was a giant of a man. But where did this impression originally come from? I'm here to meet an expert on the Wallace legend, historian Dr Fiona Watson. The, the main source for Wallace is Blind Harry, who wrote an epic poem called The Wallace, um, in which he sort of details his life from boyhood uh, into manhood and, and all the great deeds of daring do that he accomplished against the English. Harry was the source for the movie. Mel Gibson got it right, the face paint, the wild hair, the kilt, everything about the man was, was spot on, was it? Oh, well, spot on as far as uh, Blind Harry's concerned, but then there's the big question mark about whether that's got anything to do with the real William Wallace. There's this great desire to have the kind of Hello Magazine version of Wallace's life, and you've got all that in Harry, but in real life, historians can't give you anything of that, which is very tedious. So, so no. what's the problem with Harry's version of events? Well, Blind Harry was writing in the 1470s, and in the 1470s, the Scottish king, James III, was considering making peace with England. Powerful Scottish nobles didn't want to make peace with their southern neighbours, and they used Blind Harry's story to rally support. Now, there were a lot of Scottish nobles, and they really didn't want peace. They wanted to find a symbol, if you like, of categorical Scottish resistance to having anything to do with the English, and Wallace fitted the bill because he never, ever gave in. Wow, so this is classic PR that tells us more about the 1470s than it does anything about William Wallace. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yes, it tells us an awful lot about what people thought in the 1470s, but very little about the real man who lived 150 years earlier. It's obvious that most of the Wallace legend is just propaganda. And as for the blue-faced, long-haired, kilted warrior, well, that's just Hollywood. The gigantic sword displayed in the monument is now my only tangible link to this Scottish hero. Surely it can reveal something about its owner, the real Wallace, who died so horribly in 1305. Joe's journey to Scotland has drawn a blank. The only thing we know for sure was that William Wallace suffered the excruciating death of a traitor. How could the English justify such a vicious punishment for a Scot whose only crime was to fight for his own country? Historian Dr John Reuben Davis has asked me to meet him at the National Archives to see an account he recently discovered of Wallace's death sentence. Well, I found the earliest official account from the horse's mouth, as it were, of the charges made against William Wallace. 
This document was written by King Edward's officials just after Wallace's death. As loyal Englishmen, they detail the crimes Wallace was supposed to have committed against their king. Enemy of and rebel against the king, who in contempt of the king throughout Scotland falsely sought to call himself King of Scotland. So the interesting thing for me about this is it says that he set himself up as King of Scotland. Well, this is the very interesting thing about this document. Not only is it the earliest account, but nowhere else do we find this charge. If Wallace, who wasn't even a nobleman, was setting himself up as king, no wonder Edward's officials recorded such detail. But this thing about being a traitor, this doesn't make sense to me. Surely England and Scotland were separate countries at this time. Well, the King of Scots in 1296, who was John Balliol, had abdicated and he'd been publicly, ritually, ceremonially humiliated by Edward I. And all the most important people in Scotland, all the landowners, were now Edward I's sworn men. But, of course, the one person who didn't do that was William Wallace. Wallace's allegiance to the deposed Scottish King John Balliol is a vital piece in the story. This wasn't a man out for personal revenge, but someone fighting for king and country. So rather than being somebody who had lots of support, actually William Wallace was the lone voice, the man out there standing against Edward I. Well, I'm not sure I would say that he didn't have support, but he was the odd man out. Because Wallace refused to swear loyalty to him and had attacked his officials, Edward was able to declare him an outlaw. It became the duty of every Scottish noble who had taken the oath to capture Wallace for Edward. So incredibly, it was a fellow Scot who handed him over to the English. What I've learned from John is really quite shocking. Our picture of William Wallace is so different from what he's told me in there. He's essentially said that according to the standards of the time, the laws of the time, Wallace was guilty as charged, both in England and Scotland. He was a dead man walking. My visit to the Wallace Monument gave me a great sense of the myth, but no clear picture of the real man who was drawn, hanged and quartered. But the massive Wallace sword, weighing almost three kilos at 1.63 metres long, really made an impression on me. I'm determined to find out if this weapon can give us a clue to Wallace's appearance and character. I'm heading to the Wallace Collection in central London to meet arms and armour expert Dr Toby Capwell. Toby, hi, I'm Joe. Hello Joe. Good to see you, how are you? All right. As curator of one of the world's finest collections of historic weaponry, Toby knows more than most about medieval swords. Yeah, although it's a big weapon though, you'll find that it's surprisingly light and well balanced. Wow. Regardless of what Hollywood tough guys would have us believe, you don't just stick these on your back and go swaggering off into the highlands. Two-handed swords like this were used by small numbers of very highly trained knights and swordsmen going straight into the front rank of the enemy and trying to cut bloody swathes through them. But what does the Wallace sword tell us about the man himself? Absolutely nothing. Really? The Wallace Monument sword represents a double fallacy. First of all, the size of a weapon tells you nothing about how its user was built physically. A two-handed sword can be used perfectly well by someone who's four and a half feet tall. Second of all, it's not a medieval sword. Oh, really? It dates from the 16th to early 17th century. The sword first appears in historical records in 1505, 200 years after Wallace's death. It's been housed at the Wallace Monument since 1888. Well, there's a little history lesson for you. You can't judge a man by his sword. The only thought that does occur to me is just maybe by making him into this legend, this superhuman with a ginormous sword, we actually do him a disservice. Maybe he was far more normal and that would make his achievements all the greater. Wallace's last 
last journey began here at Westminster. It was here that he was sentenced to be drawn, hanged and quartered. But the journey itself was to be part of the punishment. In order to get a sense of what he went through that day, I'm going to retrace the route from here to his place of execution. The first part of this punishment was for Wallace to be drawn. His feet were tied to a horse and his head dragged along the ground because he was no longer fit to walk upon the earth. For that, he was wrapped in a bloody cowhide to humiliate him and to make sure he didn't die from being dragged along the streets. They wanted him alive for the final act. The direct route from Westminster to the place of execution would have been too short and too easy for the punishment that King Edward had in mind. First, Wallace had to be dragged along the banks of the Thames all the way up to the Tower of London. As Wallace was dragged past, many people seized their chance to hurl stones and filth at this hated figure, the Scotsman who defied their king and humiliated an English army. I've now come five kilometres from Westminster to the Tower of London. Wallace must have suffered terribly. Imagine having your head bashing against the ground for five kilometres. From here, the route went up north, uphill to Aldgate. By now, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people had turned out to catch a glimpse of the notorious Scottish outlaw. This is West Smithfield. In medieval times, the land around here was all open country. Traders and merchants did business here. The famous Smithfield meat market behind me has been trading on this site for 800 years. But on the 23rd of August, 1305, this was the scene of a different kind of butchery. For this was the site of Wallace's execution. So why here? The crucial point is this was also the location of the three day long Bartholomew Fair, which began just after the bruised and battered Wallace arrived. King Edward wanted Wallace's last agonies to be the opening act of the fair. So he was brought to a place where people had gathered to eat, drink and be merry. This is the gate of St. Bartholomew the Great's church in Smithfield, where Wallace's long and bloody journey from Westminster came to an end. I found this account in a 14th century chronicle which describes what Wallace went through that day. This is what it says. He was dragged to a very high gallows made on purpose for him, where he was hanged with a halter, then taken down half dead, after which his body was vivisected in a most cruel and torturous manner. And after he had expired, his body was divided into four quarters and his head fixed on a stake and set on London Bridge. It's obvious to me that much of what we think we know about William Wallace is actually a myth. But his death here was real. And the plaque on the wall behind me pays tribute to the man. The irony to me is if the English hadn't executed him so cruelly, if his death hadn't been so memorable, he might not be the legendary Scottish hero we remember today. The stories that intrigue us most from our past are often the bloodiest and most horrific. Names like Vlad the Impaler, Richard III and Attila the Hun have an almost mythical status. And we remain fascinated by the dark deeds of Roman emperors and rampaging Vikings. But it's easy to forget that these people and their victims were real. and that the facts are usually more complicated than the bloody tale. I'm Joe Crowley, journalist and investigator. And I'm Dr. Susanna Lipscomb, historian and author. Together, we're going to discover the secret stories behind history's most infamous characters and events. Looking again at history's crime scenes. So this is it, this is Case Cato. But what you won't find evidence of is of the man who put these places on the tourist map, SS officer Amon Leopold Gert. In the film Schindler's List, 
Gert is a murderous sadist. But what about the real man? How did he start on his path to the gallows? Hello, the Hello. Alicia. Hi, I'm Susie. Hi. I've come to meet Alicia Yakovska Natkaniec, who's been making a special study of Gert's role in the Krakow Holocaust. So tell me about Amon Gert. What sort of man was he? What was his background? Uh, he was uh, born in Austria uh, in 1908. Uh, he um, came from a middle-class family. Uh, they have a um, publishing company in Vienna. Do you think he was guilty as charged, both in England and Scotland? He was a dead man walking. Thirteenth of September, nineteen forty-six, and former SS officer Amon Gert is about to be hanged in Krakow, Poland. He's been found guilty of causing the death of thousands of Jews. His senseless, sadistic murders were dramatized in the award-winning film Schindler's List. But now Gert faces his own death, and film exists of his hideously botched execution. Was this torment accidental or a terrible act of revenge for his heinous crimes? Our new research overturns previous accounts of the death of Amon Gert. Please. Hunting down evidence. Wow, so look at these. So these are the proof. And coming to some very surprising conclusions. Think you know history's bloodiest tales? Time to think again. In this episode, we're investigating three of the most barbaric executions of all time and asking, do we really have all the facts? What is the astonishing new revelation about the botched hanging of an evil Nazi SS officer, chillingly portrayed in Schindler's List? We don't know uh, so many details about uh, his last moments. We have many legends, but no facts. Did the English really kill a feared Viking chieftain by throwing him into a pit full of venomous snakes? He brought horror to France, but the horror followed him back. And why was the real-life Braveheart William Wallace ritually dissected for treason? Wallace was... At the end of World War II, many of Germany's top Nazis were put on trial at Nuremberg, and the full horror of the Holocaust was revealed. But Amon Gert was handed over to Poland, whose people he had brutalized for years. Later, Polish archive film of his execution surfaced on the internet, and hundreds of thousands of people have watched every macabre detail. On the first two attempts to hang him, the rope snaps. Only with their third try are his executioners successful. Ever since the publication of the book Schindler's List and the hugely successful film that followed it, many of the tourists here today are looking for evidence from that time. These tourist taxes even advertise trips to the Schindler's factory and to the ghetto.